This next session will tie together a little bit of what I said earlier and what Catherine's just talked about. Because um, what I want to talk about is um, review services. And I've lost the clicker already. Anyone see it? Oh, thank you. All right. So, um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to hopefully tie together some of the stuff about principles of safety and the fact that we have safety standards. And uh, the natural question is, okay, so how do you know people are applying them? So, uh, the IEA has um, a number of uh, safety review services that we offer. Um, and they, they form part of an overall support framework. And it's, it's the way in which we offer help to member states to... Uh, for them to, to really gauge their own adherence to safety standards. And it's helpful to us as well, because when we go and do a review, we will, we will gain useful comments uh, and feedback on the safety standards that, that Catherine just talked about. And we can, we can gather that information as real sort of first-hand experience and use that when we next revise the safety standards. Uh, we also uh, find that we, we, we learn some really good things in these safety reviews um, that uh, might be information that we can share with other member states, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second as well. So we've uh, got this list, which is probably the main safety review standards. I'll talk about most of them in a bit more detail. Uh, they aren't complete because there are lots of these. The main thing I wanted to point out is that, like the, like the safety standards themselves, uh, review missions are voluntary. Uh, they are performed at the request of member states, so there is no obligation to ask for a review mission. Um, but uh, we obviously we encourage it. Uh, we like doing it. Uh, we find it helpful for for the standards. And uh, there's nothing more satisfying than helping somebody to improve their nuclear safety. Frankly, so it's very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I understand your point. Um, I, I think it is in this context. An in -ear mission, you know, is really reviewing whether a state has put in place the infrastructure required for a, for a, you know, a safe nuclear power program. So it's, it's not reviewing actual safety on the ground. I absolutely agree with you. But, it, you know, if, if you're going to embark on a nuclear power program and you go through the um, in-ear process, it's really helpful to have that have a, a review done along the way, because what you don't want is to get to the end and say, right, we're ready to build a plant now, and everyone says, are you sure? You know, it's really useful to have that, that check along the way. Um, I mean, for instance, I'm, I'm going to the United Arab Emirates in, uh, in September, and we're going to do a, a pre-operational OZART, so an Ozark mission designed for the end of construction and during commissioning. And um, it, if you like, that really is the almost the final cross-check of whether the country was effective in their infrastructure reviews all the way through. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, these, these things all hang together. But interesting question. Thanks. Uh, this is the, uh, just a quick diagram of the, of the support services. So um, we offer these peer reviews, which is uh, what I'll, I'll talk about mainly. Uh, but obviously there are also security guidelines. We can offer help on education and training. Um, there are other advisory services, the safety standards, of course. Uh, international legal instruments. Catherine talked about some of the uh, uh, conventions. And there's also knowledge networks in which you can gain easy access to if you look on the, on the IEA website. And there's a number of uh, uh, international or regional uh, uh, knowledge networks. <coughs> um, you know, just pick one up, the Asian Nuclear Safety Network, where you know, some of the Asian countries have got together to help themselves to uh, gather their knowledge of nuclear safety you know, in the Asian region. Okay. Now I'm a, I'm an operations guy. I'm a station, you know, power station guy. So I'm going to approach this very much from the nuclear power operational nuclear power plant perspective. However, the the principles that we use in OZART, operational safety review team, are very similar to the way in which we approach safety reviews in other areas as well, whether they be regulatory, 
um, or research reactors or fuel cycle facilities. So the principles are very similar. So by going through this in a bit more detail, you will get an overview about how it's done in many other safety review services. So what does it do? Um, so an OZAR provides advice, assistance to member states in, in enhancing their operational safety. Um, it's not just operating nuclear power plants, but it is for those plants reaching the end of construction and just about to go in, well, I, I, probably in the middle of, of commissioning as well. Um, and we call that a pre-operational safety review. And that's why we're doing it at uh, Baraka in a month's time. Um, although it says there it could be focused to review only a few specific areas, we strongly recommend that when a member state asks for an OZART, that they ask for the full OZART service. Because frankly, a lot of things all tied together. And if you think back to what I was talking about earlier in terms of leadership, management, um, you know, and, and all that stuff about whether, whether management is taking an overall view of safety across the whole plant. Um, if, if you missed out emergency preparedness and chemistry and technical support and only looked at operations and maintenance, you wouldn't get a really good picture of whether the plant as a whole was, uh, was really effective in applying the whole of the, uh, of the operating safety standards. So we do, we do strongly recommend taking uh, the whole mission. Um, if necessary, if, if, an, if a member state wanted to just focus on one small area, they could ask for something different, which would be an expert mission. And we, we'd bring along a different team just to look at that specific technical area. But for an overall review in operational safety, we recommend OZART. Uh, when we do a mission, we, we also recommend that you ask us to come back. In, 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 it, it says 12 to 18 months there, but actually um, I will change this slide because we actually prefer 18 to 24 months because some things take longer to address than 12 months. You know, if we find an issue and give you advice on how to fix it, it can be quite challenging to fix that and see the results within 12 months. So we usually recommend 18 to 24 months. I've just come back from a review mission in a follow-up mission in Japan, and that was two years after the original mission, and that was that felt about right. Well, I'm, I'm the review is uh, is almost uh, an Ozart is almost three weeks. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry. That we need to change the number, but, uh, oh, I see. Uh, yeah, I, I will, when I change this, I will, I will be 18 to 24 months. Yes, but I mean, from, from construction, from uh, the construction phase, maybe it's good but to change. But from operation, I'm going to do, if you have any, uh, any note, I mean, a mark, or I still think, you know, it's a little bit to follow up after 24 months. Well, you know, it, it's it's a it's a very interesting point. Uh, thing, things vary. You know, some some things you go to a plant and you'll see something simple like, you know, guys, you you, you don't really have good control over access to your radiation controlled area, and that that's pretty easy to fix. You could probably fix that in a couple of weeks. Um, but if if you go there and you say, you know, actually, uh, you don't have a very good configuration management control system. So you think that, that includes uh, design, understanding the design basis, having it all documented, having in place a modification control system. Um, you know, those things take a bit longer to fix. So you, know, you, you, you need to give people time to, to make the changes. They might, be, they might need to get them agreed with the regulator put them in place, and then have enough run time to sort of show results as well. Because when, when we come back, we like you to tell us, well, we did this. Uh, this was the change. This is what we did. This is the plan. We've done it. It's in place now. It's all documented. And this is why we think it's worked. Because for the last few months, we've seen the improvement. You know, We might have seen the number of non-conformances come down over a period of time. So um, you're right. Some things take less. Some things take more. On average, we would recommend 18 to 24 months. It, it, it's just born out of experience. So what does it look like? Pretty simple. First thing is, we come along and tell you what it's all about. So if you want an Ozark mission, we don't say, OK, we can come on Monday. 
doesn't quite work like that. <laughs> because we've, we've got probably a team of 14, 15 people, and we draw them from all around the world uh, in, each, in each area. So the first thing we do is we come and tell you what it's all about. Um, because there's a lot of work required at the plant. And actually, we do that usually about 12 months before, before the mission. Um, and two people will come along. It's usually, the, you know, I, I, when we get the request, I will nominate a team leader and a deputy team leader. And they will come and they will meet the team on the plant. Um, it's a sort of a two-way communication thing. And we'll tell you what it's all about, how, to, how it works, what to expect, and how to prepare for it. Next, the actual mission itself happens, um, again, led by the IEA, a team leader and uh, a deputy team leader. I like to have another person from the IEA there as well, because you never know what's going to happen. Um, someone gets ill, somebody has a family crisis and has to go home, so I actually like to send three people from the IEA. Um, but nevertheless, we have an IEA leadership team, and then we'll have... 12, maybe actually more external experts now. And it says two and a half weeks there. It's, it is about two and a half weeks. We arrive on a Monday. We get in, onboarded into the plant, so we need to know your, your rules on your plant. Uh, there's a bit more training to do for, for, the, for the site people and for the team itself. And then it's eight or nine days' worth of intensive review. And that intensive review includes making sure that we communicate very closely with the site team so that we don't surprise you at the end of the mission. And then we'll write a report, a draft report. In fact, we call it technical notes. And we'll have an exit meeting where we'll present the results um, to you. So we, we, we don't leave the site until we give you the report in your hand. Very important to us that we leave you with that clear information. We, uh, when, we, when we immediately leave the plant, we, we leave the draft, what we call the technical notes, with the, with the plant itself. Yeah, with the, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we actually hand it to the plant manager, whoever the plant manager is. Yeah. Uh, so you do it to the other plant. Now, we, uh, we try to be fully transparent, so we always invite the regulator to the exit meeting, and we also meet with the regulator a couple of times during the mission itself, just so that they can get a flavor of how it's going, what we're finding, um, just so that you know, we, we don't want to surprise the regulator either. But anyway, we leave, we leave the report with the, the plant after, at the end of the, the two and a half, three week mission. Sorry, Sorry the, I missed you. Yeah. Where is the job of the external experts, and don't they Um, I'll, I'll deal with your first question first, and then I'll, I'll ask you to clarify your second question. So the, the, the external experts are there to review the different review areas. So there are about 10, depending on, on what the, the member say asks for, there are 10 or 12 review areas, and we bring a different external expert to review each review area. Now, th those, those reviewers will be pretty experienced in that review area. So, for instance... Um, I'm, I'm doing, when I go to Baraka in three weeks' time, I'm taking two operations reviewers, one from the UK and one from Russia. Uh, we're getting the leadership and management expert from Spain. We're getting um, the maintenance reviewer, I think, from Hungary. So the, the essence of it is we get an international perspective. That's, that's important to us because we don't want there to be too much of one country's bias in the report. We want it to be an international report uh, with international experience. It also promotes more widely the safety standards in a wider range of countries as well. So what was your second question? No, the second question is, um, since we are not IEA yeah. staff members, uh -huh. uh, we are from a certain organization. Yeah. Uh, to tell the truth, no. I mean, you know, politics being what it is, there are there are sometimes member states that would rather not have experts from certain countries. You know, different countries are friends or not friends with certain countries. So you, you might get one country saying, we, we're happy with an international team, but to be honest, it, it would be more difficult for us if you invited someone from that country. 
So we say, we understand, we're not, we don't get in the way of that, we will find an expert that everybody is happy with. Um, the fact that they're not IEA experts is, is fine, it's what we want, because we, we can't hold within, I mean, within my team, looking after Ozarts, I've, got, I've got, only got three people. Um, so I, I cannot send enough experts from the IAEA from my team to do all this. So we, we bring people from who are actually used to applying the IEA standards in, in their own country to do the mission. Now, obviously, what we also do is we, we provide them up front with some training about how we expect them to do the review because we want to be clear that when they come, they're reviewing that, that plant against the safety standards, not against what they're used to in their own country and not even against what the regulations are in that other country. You know, we're all, the, only, the only thing we're knowledgeable about is the IEA safety standards. It's impossible for us to hold um, knowledge of the regulations in every single country. It's just not possible. Does that, does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you. Good, good, good question. And then, as I say, we, we do a follow-up mission um, about uh, uh, 18 months to two years after. And again, I take two people. We, we take two people from the IEA, and usually two or three of the original team, uh, because uh, you know we're not reviewing the whole thing again. We're just reviewing the issues that we found, so we, we can get away with a smaller team. I was in Japan recently, and we had two IEA and two external experts. Uh, it, it's for the plant to address the issues that were found and left with them. So, um, well, they they have discretion about when they ask us to come back. I mean, we we, we ask them if they to to put it in a, in the eighteen month to two year period, but you know, again, nuclear power stations being what they are, they may say, well, you know, we've got a major outage in that period and we've got a lot of work to do. Could we either bring it forward or could we bring it back? And we're, we're very flexible about that. You know, we, we understand that we have to accommodate their own work schedules. You know, we, we don't want to get in the way of that. So if, uh, if they say, could we make it 26 months? We say, that's fine, no problem. You know. No, no, we, no, we don't. We don't. We don't get that. Um, not in my experience. I, I've only been with the AC three years, uh, but you know, some of my team have been there quite a bit longer, and, and I've asked a similar question. And we, we don't tend to get um, regulatory interference or, or recommendations. They're they, they're usually very interested in the results because, of course, they want to know how does what we find compare with what they find as a regulator. So they're very interested in that. But they don't, they don't tend to get in the way of, uh, of the timing of things. So these are the areas that we, uh, we, always, we, we, we always want to, to review. Um, so if, we call these the standard areas because really these ought to be addressed by every nuclear power plant. So leadership, training, operations, maintenance, tech support, operating experience, radiation protection, chemistry, immersive preparedness, accident management, and then human technology and organizational interactions, which together with the leadership and management is where we start to address those cultural issues that I was talking about this morning. So this is a fairly new, uh, a new, fairly new module. And then we also uh, offer some other optional areas depending on the, on the, uh, the plant itself. So for a, for a plant at the beginning of its life, which is just about to be commissioned, we will come and do a pre ozart which adds to this the commissioning module. Uh, if a plant has been running a long time and, it, and is considering extending its operating license uh, to extend the license, we will look at long-term operation. So that's how are they preparing for long-term operation? Do they have all the, all the things in place for that? If they are planning to shut down or within the next four to five years, we, will, we can also come and, and, and ask um, questions about, well, okay, so how are you preparing for decommissioning? What preparations are you in place? You know, you don't just turn the plant off, take the fuel out, and leave it. It, it. There is still a residual hazard there that has to be addressed. And um, we can do a specific module on safety culture, which is in more detail. Uh, or we can also, and we've done this one recently, actually, for the first time in a few years, we can look at how they're using probabilistic safety assessment to 
to help them with their decision making on the plant. Um, probabilistic safety assessment is, of, is often used in the design phase, but it can also be used in the operational phase to help them to make decisions, especially when you're in an outage situation or when you're planning for an outage. When you're, you're taking uh, pieces of equipment out of service to maintain it, but you still need that equipment potentially to keep the plant cool and keep it safe. So, okay, the hazard goes down when you shut the plant down, but you're potentially uh, infringing on the safety because you're taking plant out of service to fix it or to maintain it. So the probabilistic safety assessment can be very helpful there. How many have we done? Well, uh, we are in the middle of one in the US right now, and that is the 195th in the series. So we do them all over the world. So uh, everywhere there's a nuclear power plant. Uh, we, well, well, not, we haven't done a nose on every single nuclear power plant, but we've probably covered all the countries um, and most of the plants by now. So 195. Um, how does it work? OK, so we, we really look at two, two different types of things. We look at uh, what we call the program-based things, and that really um, is about do you have the right systems in place, the right documentation, the right processes? And we can look at that, compare that with the standards. We can go and talk with people, see how they actually do it, uh, and we'll gather the facts together um, of what, about what we see. Other things, we'll go out and look in the field. So we'll go to the main control room and, and actually observe people doing uh, manipulations on the plant control boards. So how do they, how do they manage reactivity? Um, how do they manage a shutdown? How do they plan activities like maintenance? Um, how will they do chemistry monitoring? And through those field observations, we'll also collect facts. And what we usually find is if there are gaps within the processes, you'll find gaps out in the field as well. It's, it, it's almost self-evident. Commissioning is an interesting, an interesting module because although we review commissioning during a, a pre-operational OZART, we don't actually have commissioning as, a, as an area of single expertise because commissioning actually touches all sorts of different things. It obviously touches operations and management, but it also touches how maintenance has, has interacted with the construction teams to, to transfer the knowledge of the systems and, and what, what their requirements are. We, what most plants do is that they will put permanent station staff onto commissioning teams to understand how the plant works, uh, get to understand its characteristics, and they, and they will use that information when they're writing the maintenance strategies for the plant as well. Um, it's, it's the same with chemistry. It's the same with radiation protection. Many tests. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. So your role in that is, did you, uh, do you bring the, the uh, participate or observe? Or uh, if, like yeah, well, if there is a commissioning test in progress, we would go and we would observe it. And our, our interest, actually, is not just in the test itself, but it's in how the commissioning team, which is usually separate to the operation, to the, to the main plant team, our interest is also in how the commissioning team interfaces with them with the permanent station staff so are they are they using this opportunity to get people to understand what happens when they start this plant up for the first time or uh, you know how how the plant behaves when it's running for the very first time so i would expect the engineering people to be there saying okay what what, what are the vibration characteristics will it meet its performance criteria you know does it develop enough pressure uh, did that diesel start in the time scale that we that we needed to start in? So they will be gathering a lot of that information as well. So, you know, it's it's not for us to judge the adequacy necessarily of the commissioning test. That's for the commissioning team to do. But we want to know that it was well planned, well organized, well executed, and you're using the opportunity to help to train the permanent staff of the, of the plant as well. No, 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 it's, it, because, because the IEA has no authority to judge whether a commissioning test is satisfactory or not. That, that is for the plant to judge. And, you know, if, if they have to convince the regulator that that is a, you know, that, because you might be commissioning a safety system or a non-safety system, if it's on a safety system, they would have to be able to provide evidence to the regulator that that safety system met its safety mission. Um, 
But if it's a commissioning test on a, a condensate pump, well, it's not safety related. You, you know, the regulator is not really interested in that. So we gather all these facts together, and the experts and the team leaders will then formulate an issue. So we're, we're trying there to, uh, to understand what we've seen, what does it mean, what is its safety impact. Okay, can we now write something that, try, that really describes this issue and uh, make some suggestion or recommendation to the plant on how to fix, on what needs fixing, not how to fix it, but what needs fixing. In the meantime, of course, uh, we're working with the plant people, and we are always asking for them to make sure that we understand what we're seeing correctly. Because we, we, it's, it's very important that we don't go off on a tangent and, and, and make a conclusion which is inaccurate because we just didn't understand how the process works. So we try to make sure we get good feedback from the counterparts and the whole team as well. Uh, because you might have somebody who's an expert reviewer in maintenance, but that person might well have had a lot of experience also in commissioning or technical support. So we use the strength of the team in, in, in all these missions. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, we, that, that happens a lot, yeah. So the, the mission is always conducted in English, but if the, if the language of the member state is in English, we, we arrange for interpreters to, to go there with them. So either the member state will provide the interpreters, or if necessary, we, we can find interpreters as, as well. So, uh, you know, obviously when I, I was at Russia, in, in a Russian plant two years ago, and the whole mission was done in English, but all of the, all of the interactions with the site people were done with interpreters. Are you ensure that the client It's accurate. Mm. Yeah. Uh, to tell the truth, you, you have to take it on trust. Um, you know, if, if we get into the situation, well, you know, if, if we have to take it on trust because if you start to say, to an, how, how do you say to somebody through an interpreter, uh, I don't believe you. <laughs> yes, no, you're, you're quite right. And, and, and it, it's something that we are very aware of. It, it, it is a good question because I've, I've struggled with this as well. Sometimes you, you can ask a question through an interpreter, and you ask a very simple question, and the answer takes five minutes. Yeah, yeah. And you think, wow, that was, a, that was an easy question. But, you know, uh, you know, or, or the other way around is also very interesting, where you, know, you have, a, you have a, a question about a complex issue, yeah. and then they say, uh, no, it's OK. <laughs> you think, well, I'm not sure if you really understood the, you know, the significance of the question I was asking. So it, it does happen from time to time, and, and you, you just have to say to the interpreter, look, um, that was a very short answer, but I would appreciate more and more detail about this or this or this. So you have to just recognize it and, and, and keep probing, asking more questions until you are sufficiently convinced. But th there is a degree of trust there. But, you know, um, what, what I would say to you is that, you know, um, in my experience, People on nuclear power plants are very passionate about safety. They want their plant to be safe because you know, they, live in, they live near the plant. Their, their kids live near the plant. And they, they, they genuinely want their plant to be safe. So you know, the, there is a very real um, uh, you know, self-interest in, in, in finding out what somebody else can help you with. If you think somebody else can help you do your work better or more safely, wow, that, for me, that's like free. Free information for nothing, you know. So it's that, that's how I, I find most of the missions go. All the missions go. Um, this might come to, back to some of the questions that you've asked. We think Ozart is is objective because the only standards that we use are the safety object, the safety standards, the IA safety standards. So everything's judged against the same thing, and we don't we don't judge. Uh, a, a plant on the, the standards of the experts from their own countries, and we don't use even the country's regulations. We just use the safety standards. We bring along very well-qualified reviewers with diverse international experience. So we'll, we'll train them first in how to do a mission, and uh, we might even take them as an observer on a mission before they do a real mission. And then we allow them to be a reviewer, and we, 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 uh, we try to keep hold of the good ones and ask them to come back and do reviews again. Uh, we have a standard scope, but we can customize it. 
Uh, the, the review itself is very transparent because we, we make sure that we always tell people what we see and what, um, ask them to tell us if it's accurate or not. And I, as a team leader, will have a daily meeting with the plant manager to say, look, uh, this is what we're finding. Um, we think it means this, but we're still gathering data. But, you know, if you, if you don't think we've got on this correct, please tell us and we'll go back and look at it again. So we're very transparent about how we do this. But we're very keen not to surprise a plant at the end. And it's also de-restricted. So um, our, our, our policy is that when, when the final report is published, um, it's, it's restricted for 90 days for a, for a plant or a member state to consider how they would respond if they had questions on this report from the general public or from people who don't like nuclear power. But our, our strong preference is that, we, that they allow us to de-restrict the report 90 days after its issue. And, my and I've never had anybody come back to us and say, no, we want this report to remain restricted um, in the three years I've been doing it. I, and I'm only aware of one, of one Ozark report ever being requested to be kept restricted. And that's in 195 missions. So most member states these days, they recognize that if they're going to get public support for nuclear power, they have to be open and transparent. Oops, sorry. So it will have to do in advance Yes, yeah, yeah. Now, what we, and what we do is, can you remember I mentioned on one of the slides that we have a preparatory meeting a year in advance? And we, we're very clear then. You know, we say, look, um, our policy is that the report will be de-restricted after 90 days. You, as a member state, you have the right to, to ask us not to de-restrict it, if you so wish. But you know, that is our policy. And uh, on, unless you tell us that so they've got a right to us, that they want this to remain restricted, it will be de-restricted. But, but we are very clear a year in advance about, about what this means. We, again, we don't want to surprise them. Um, some, well, it, that varies. Another, another great question. Some, some countries uh, will publish the report on their, web, on their own internal websites, um, or the regulator might publish it on, on, on their website, so either the utility website or the regulator. Um, some countries will just provide it on request, and some countries say, um, well, Go and ask the IEA for a copy. Now we won't we won't release it, even though it's de-restricted. We we don't release it unless we talk with a member state. So we'll say we've had a request from this organisation. It's de-restricted. So we do intend to provide this organisation with a copy or this person with a copy, but we want you to be aware because again we don't want to surprise the member state. So that, that's how it works. But not everybody treats it the same. No, no, no. We don't take it. No, we we, uh, we don't take any documents away from the site at all. Um, the the only thing we come away with is the the knowledge in our head and the uh, the, the the draft report itself. Yeah, we don't we don't take any information away. Uh, it's, and it's it's very important to us that that our experts understand that. They all sign a confidentiality agreement before they come on the mission, uh, which acknowledges that they they are not allowed to take any material away from the plant at all during the mission, or or at the end, and they're also not allowed to discuss the uh, the mission even after. the o The only people who are allowed to discuss the mission are the IAEA and the member states. Mm -hmm. So the the experts sign that confidentiality agreement. So some mission some before. Uh, what we uh, what we do is we we ask the plan to provide us what, with what's called an advance information pack, because the I mean two and a half weeks or three weeks sounds like a long time, but it's not really. So we ask we ask the plant to provide us with advance information on the plant structures, the management processes, uh, what's gone wrong in the last three years, so events that they've had in the last three years. It's, well, it's actually, the advanced information pack is sent to us electronically. We put it onto a secure website, and we only give the password to the secure website to the people who are coming on the mission. And once the mission's over, we take that password away, so you, know, you can't go back five years afterwards and, and, and gain a, you know, get hold of the information. So it's only there for a, 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 
about a month or so in advance of the mission so that the team can review the information. And uh, then once the mission is over, it's, it's no longer available. But you mentioned that you have a channel. Yeah. That well, no, we don't send them the information, but we give them access to it. Now, uh, you know, so they, they, can, they can log on to the website and, 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 and look at it. And, you know, if they want, they could download it and print it and give it to somebody who wasn't very friendly to nuclear power. Um, that's not the sort of people we're looking for on our missions. But, you know, they could do that if they wanted. In, in the same way that, you know, they could go to the plant and be given a document to read and they could photocopy it and take it away. But that's not the sort of people that we, we look for on the missions. And if someone, if someone were to do that, then we would, we, would, we would take them off the mission. You know, we would, we, we would deal with it. Why you allow that down everywhere? Read anyway, that it can be downloaded. you well, what, what, to be honest, once it's on your, once it's on a screen, because you know you have to read it electronically. Once it's on that screen, you can screen capture it anyway. You know, so you know, it, it's there's there's no real safety benefit in not allowing the people to, to to read it or download it. But we, you know, before that, they have to sign the confidentiality agreements. <laughs> uh, there is a there is a degree of trust in all of this. Uh, we, now, as well as looking at stations, we can also look at corporate organisations. Um, so we look at corporate man the, the things we look at in corporate organizations is corporate management, independent nuclear oversight, uh, human resources, communications, particularly with the public and particularly in emergency situations, and then corporate support for technical functions like operating experience, chemistry, fuel management, etc. Because the corporate organization in, in, in many organizations has a significant impact on how the plants maintain their safety. Uh, it depends on the organization itself. But you know, if you go to some of the bigger organizations, say EDF in France, big fleet, big centralized engineering function. So they do a lot of the design basis stuff within that central function. So it's right that we have a way to look at them. Uh, another, another plant, you know, the, org the organization might only have one plant. So all of that is done on the plant or in, in an associated head office. So you know that we we have to be able to cater for all these different situations, but the process is exactly the same. I've mentioned that. Um, that's exactly the same. So just very briefly to uh, to top up or to finish up on Ozark, it's been going a long time. It started in 1982, so a long time now. Uh, we use the safety standards. It's uh, recognized in uh, our general conference and even in the Convention on Nuclear Safety Review meetings. Uh, they are publicly available, so they help us, or they help the industry to communicate openly. And uh, it's also very well, it's, it's well appreciated by regulators, because although organizations like WANO will come and do very similar peer reviews, WANO reports <laughs> are, are kept highly confidential. They are only available to the organization that asks for the, the, the WANO review. So the regulator officially never gets to see the WANO reports. I mean, they do to a degree, but officially never. So the fact that the OZART report is, is available to them is very helpful to the regulator. Uh, you can look on the website. Um, I've got a slight concern that the website might have changed and now look a bit different. But if you go into, uh, if you just search, you know, do Google and say, IAEA Ozark, you'll find this information, and certainly all of the all the links, oops, all the links will will be working. We use guidelines to help people to do the, uh, uh, the mission, and again, we we make all these guidelines available to the plant in advance, so the plant actually knows all the questions we'll go and ask them. They know all the questions. Um, we capture all the results in a database called Osmir, which is Ozark Mission Report Database. Uh, so if you have a nuclear power plant, um, you will have access to this, and you ask for it, you will have access to this Ozark mission database. Um, yeah, again, I, I need to get a new screenshot because we've just refreshed it and made it look a bit more modern. But essentially, we've captured all of the recommendations and suggestions that we've made on every single Ozark mission in all of the different areas. And we've also captured all the good things that we see because we don't, we don't just capture the things that people ought to fix. We try and capture something that we think is really, really good, better than any, anything we've seen elsewhere, that we think will be helpful to somebody else. 
So, for instance, when I went to this Russian plant, they had a they had a way of of um, finding out um, the age or sorry the irradiation of a leaking fuel assembly in the reactor when the reactor was still at power, and they could split it down into when that fuel assembly was loaded because usually they st the fuel assemblies stay in for maybe three fuel cycles. So it, it, it would either be fairly new or it's been in through one cycle or it's been in through two cycles. And when you want to find that leaking fuel assembly during an outage, it's very helpful to find it as quickly as possible. So by knowing if it's in the first batch, the second batch or the third batch, it's very helpful. And we've never seen that anywhere else, the way that they did it. So we made that available as a good practice for anybody else who runs that sort of reactor to be able to use. Yeah. Three thousand. Yeah. 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 How many limited? How many are? It's already limited or actually. Well, we. Um, I would like to say three thousand. <laughs> um, and the truth is, it won't. It won't be all of them because sometimes um, a recommendation might not be implement, implemented because the plant does something different. They might modify the plant to, to take away a vulnerability. Or we, they might do something else which changes the whole thing. I mean, say, say they had an organizational issue, which we gave them a recommendation on. And they, they subsequently went through a completely different, a whole reorganization of the company, which changed the way the plants operate. So the, the, the recommendation might no longer be valid. So we would, we would withdraw that recommendation, because something else has happened in the meantime. But mo most, I, I would say, the vast majority of the recommendations and suggestions are, are resolved. Now, not, they're not all resolved within two years. But what, when, when we go back for the follow-up mission, we review all the recommendations and suggestions. And we, we give them one of three statuses. We either say they are resolved, in which case you fix the problem, or you've made satisfactory progress in the time that you've had. Because some things do take longer than two years. And if, if you've convinced us that, you know, or they convinced the experts that what you're doing is the right thing and it has a high probability of success, we will say satisfactory progress and it's for you to finish. Occasionally, we think, you know, you, you've just not understood this issue uh, or you've not done something that's effective and we have to say insufficient progress. And that does happen. But usually, our, our usual finding is that after two years, Somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of the issues are resolved. Somewhere between 40 and maybe 50 percent are satisfactory progress. And occasionally you get one or two that are insufficient progress. But our, our, our average um, since we began Ozart is over 90 percent are either resolved or satisfactory progress. And in the last five years or so, it's actually the average is 95%. So people have got better and better at this, which is pretty much what you expect. So that was Ozart. Now, a lot of the same review principles apply to other missions. So, uh, so I, I won't go into these other ones in as much detail. But the same principles of how you do the review, how you write the report, how you present the report, it's, it's all very, very similar. Yeah. Uh, and no, no. Actually, Ozart is is nuclear power plants, only. only nuclear power plants. But I will cover other things when I when I talk about other things because there are there are other missions. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll we'll, we'll cover that in, in just a few moments. Yeah, yeah. Now, so this one, uh, this is probably the other the other review service that gets um, the most requests. It's it's a review of regulatory aspects in a country. So it's integrated regulatory review service. It's pretty much what you expect from the title. Um, it looks at the national regulatory infrastructure and compares that with what we recommend in the safety standards. Uh, it helps us and the regulator in that country to learn about the different approaches of the organization and uh, the different practices of different national regulators because, again, we bring expert regulators from all the different countries or many different countries. It also, as, we, as I said earlier, it helps us to get feedback on the application of the safety standards and whether it's actually helping countries to, uh, to um, uh, provide a safe level of, uh, of regulation. Uh, and again, we have uh, follow-up missions. And again, the, the, the recommendation is around two years. 
Um, we often find it's a bit longer than two years in, in regulatory space, but that's just the way it goes. So what, is, what does IRRS look at? So it looks at responsibilities and functions of the government, um, the global regime for, say, for regulation, uh, looks at the actual regulatory body in, in the country, what these responsibilities are, how it works as an organization, and then we look at the more, the more technical things from a regulation perspective. So how do they authorize activities to happen? How do they review plants and how do they review safety cases? What do they ins how do they inspect a nuclear plant? How do they enforce actions when, they, when they're not happy? Um, and you know, how do their regulations and guides stack up against uh, the, uh, the, the safety standards? And of course, usually they all, they also require to regulate emergency preparedness and response. Um, so we look at that as well, and we look at interfaces with security. So those those are the technical things that that, that we that the IRS looks at from a regulatory perspective. But the, the techniques for doing it are all much the same, in in the fact that uh, we will look at documentation and processes, and uh, we'll go and we will go and talk with regulators in the regulatory office, potentially also at the plants as well. Again, there are guidelines. Um, so there are, there are no secrets to how we do this. These guidelines are all publicly available. Uh, it was revised only four years ago, but it's actually being revised again. So there's a new version due out soon. Uh, so this helps regulators in the country to prepare for the mission. So it's proven very effective. Um, gets very good feedback from regulators uh, um, where we go. Uh, we recommend that regulators invite it regularly. Um, and we have been round, we're on a second round now with a couple of countries. I think the UK has, uh, has, has invited a second round of the IRS. It's a fairly mature process now. It's not been running as long as those are, but I think it's been running about 15 years. Um, lessons learned from the past missions are used for further development of the process and also fed back into the regulatory safety standards. Um, and obviously we, we encourage um, regulators to participate because they, they learn, well first of all they bring their experience, but also they learn a lot about how regulation is done in other countries, which helps them to benchmark on, on their own regulatory practices. Okay, someone asked earlier about uh, nuclear infrastructure. So, um, just a few words on that. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll be covering these things in, in probably less and less detail. But this is really um, uh, a review service that uh, helps countries that are considering embarking on a nuclear power program. So this really starts before a country has even made a decision to do it, to make a nuclear power program. So what, what does a country need to, to form an inform, to get an informed view about whether it should do it or not? Because it, it all, it can sound very glamorous. Oh, we've got a modern nuclear power program. Um, but the responsibilities and the long-term nature of a nuclear power program, it's very easy to underestimate those. Once you take into account you know, the legislative and regulatory requirements that you need, the fact that you, you probably need to want to put in place an educational system which brings people up through a technical route. So how do you train the technicians, the engineers, the regulators, the suppliers um, in your country to be able to support a nuclear program? Um, how do you choose a site? How would you assess a site? There's an awful lot that needs to take place before you even get near a decision to, to, to implement a nuclear program. So this really is, is designed to provide a structured framework of guidance to help a country make a good decision. And, you know, some countries have considered it and said, yeah, okay, not yet. We'll do it later. And there are certainly countries recently who, who, who were close to making that decision but have decided just to make it a bit later on. And that's, that's a good decision in its own right. Uh, other countries have gone through this process and said, yep, yeah, we are ready, we are prepared. This is something that we absolutely want to do. And the UAE is a great example. And, and they're close to commissioning their first unit. Um, so it'll help to evaluate the national infrastructure. It'll obviously identify gaps. They might be technical gaps in the, in the uh, 
the industrialized nature of the country or in the education available in the country. There might be anything. You know, it might be in a, in a highly seismically active zone. So that might be a perspective that you want to build in. Um, and it will obviously make recommendations and suggestions about how to make progress. Because it's one thing to make a decision. It's another to start letting contracts, which, which is a, a major financial commitment. You know, a nuclear plant these days is you know, probably going to be you know, between 5 and $10 billion US. So it's a major, a major financial commitment. And then you know, actually being ready to construct and commission the first unit. So it's in three stages. Um, we have some guidance on this. And uh, th this is slightly different to some of the other uh, missions, I, I'll review missions I'll, I'll talk about, because this one is actually run out of our nuclear energy department, not our nuclear safety department. But here we have the milestones in development of a nuclear, uh, a national infrastructure for nuclear power. And we've got evaluation of the status of the national nuclear infrastructure. And we'll, again, as usual, we've got guidance on how to prepare for and how we conduct these in-air missions. So all the information is, is freely available. Uh, there are 19 uh, topics that are addressed in the, in the mission. And again, as you'd expect, it starts from the national position. Uh, you know, how, how is, the, how is the, the country set up for the, the decision to go on a nuclear power program? And, of course, then it starts going through the legislation, the safeguards, the regulations, and then gets into other things like developing human resources, so your education and training perspectives, uh, down into other things like the site. Uh, stakeholders, very important. If you haven't got a nuclear program, it's all new for people. People will, when you say to people, what do you think about nuclear? What's the first word that comes into your head? It's usually Fukushima or Chernobyl. Um, so you have to have stakeholders involved, um, environmental protection, the fuel cycle, what, what will you do with the waste that comes from the nuclear program, um, and how, you know, all the other things down into the details of, you know, how will you procure the equipment. Some countries might not be willing to sell you stuff. They may, they may think it's their own intellectual property. Um, so will you procure it internal to the country? All sorts of things to think about. Okay, other review services. Um, I mentioned earlier that we, we look at long-term operation in, in, in Ozart, and we do. Um, but we actually also have a more in-depth review of long-term operation as well, which we call SALTA, or Safe Long-Term Operation. And uh, although Ozart will give you a very good overview of your preparations for long-term operation, a SALTO mission will actually concentrate on that one area and allow you to really look at whether you have the, the right management process in place, and it will then dive down into the specific issues of the civil structures on the plant, the electrical and instrumentation type issues, and the mechanical plant issues. And it will look at all of the aging management programs you've got in place, how you assess degradation of these uh, components and structures, and it will also go back into the, the human side and about how you address the knowledge management part of long-term operation. Because as I said earlier, usually on a nuclear plant lasts for 40 years, and you get people like me who joined it as young people, and you, you, you go through the entire program, and just at the time the plant's going into long-term operation, people like me are thinking, you know, it's about time I retired. So how do you hand the knowledge of people like me onto the next generation of people who you want to keep your plant safe? Very important, absolutely crucial. Um, of course, yeah, we'll identify issues and give you some idea of what we think we need to fix. Uh, and again, a good exchange of experience. If, you, if you're doing something really well on that plant, we will ask you if we can take that and share it with the industry. And we're just creating another database that will help us to do that. Um, but also, um, you know, the, the experts who come and, and help you with the assessment, they will also take back that information to their own plants. And that will help them to do that, that work better as well. So we look at the organization, the licensing basis, uh, we look at what you need to do up front. In other words, have you got good maintenance programs already? Have you got surveillance programs already? Have you got your equipment qualification program in place? And then we look at the programs in the three main areas. And then we look at the human resources and knowledge management issues. Then we look at, we start to look at other nuclear facilities. So Ozark, we dealt with operational or, or uh, commissioning operating 
sorry, commissioning nuclear power plants, but we also look at fuel cycle facilities. And I'm, I, I apologize for the abbreviations. It's, uh, it's, it makes me cringe, but we have to give them all a different name. So this is the safety evaluation of fuel cycle facilities. So and they, they themselves can be very varied because they could be fuel cycle facilities in the um, uh, construction and, and fabrication of new fuel, or it could be how you deal with spent fuel once it's taken out of the reactor. Um, or it could be the, with the waste that arises from plutonium reprocessing. So they look at conversion and enrichment, fuel fabrication, spent fuel storage, reprocessing, and fuel cycle research and development. Now, for some places, that will all occur on one site. There's a site in the UK that does pretty much all of that, apart from fuel fabrication. Uh, they do pretty much all the rest. Um, but in some countries, all these are done on different sites. So how we do it depends on the site itself. And again, uh, there's a well-understood, structured way of things that we look at. So again, it starts with management, training, how you operate the facility, and then it goes down into the particular technical hazards that you find on that. So strange though it may seem, you don't often have a criticality issue on a nuclear power plant. Until the fuel is in the reactor, it's, it, it would be quite unusual for you to run up against a criticality issue. Um, but criticality can occur, of course, as we, as we started off with at the beginning of this morning, on other facilities where you've got uranium or plutonium um, being moved around or it's in fluid form and the, fluid, you know, the assembly of that can be, can be absolutely uh, crucial to whether you've got a critical assembly. Um, and of course, in, in with that is uh, fire safety as well because you don't be spreading water around when you've got uh, solutions of critical material. So uh, I, won't, I won't dwell on this. Uh, this uh, is legal, legal purposes. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the nature of your question. So, yeah, so we find a problem with modification. modification. Yeah, yeah. The goal of the mission is safety only. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Some legal point of view. If they find something, mm. uh, radiation or something mm -hmm. in the process or whatever, mm -hmm. and maybe something under the operation. Yeah, yeah. Some legal point of view. Yeah. So do, do they have the authority or the, uh, to write for the IEA? When you when you say they, do you mean the the plant itself? The yeah. The 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 okay. So if if the facility disagrees with the conclusion, um, that 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 point is is um, discussed and agreed on before the end of the mission. So, you know, if they say we think our modification process is fine, and we say well. Yes, but this is what the safety standards require, and you don't comply with the safety standards. You know, there either is a gap or there isn't a gap. So we have we have to have that discussion during the mission itself. Um, it's pretty rare that we we disagree on the facts because the whole the whole of the mission is based on observed facts. So if we just to pick a a, a, a slightly different example, say say that you know there, there should be a process for training the operations personnel. And we go to a plant and we say, okay, so um, how do you train your operations personnel? And they say, well, uh, we, uh, we, we just train them on the job. And we say, well, the, the safety standard requires formal classroom training and technical training. What, what do you do in that area? And if they say, well, we don't do that because we rely on university training. I say, okay, well, that, that, that's different to what the safety standard says. So you either accept the fact that there's a, there's a difference or not. And we, we it's, I, I've never personally come across a fact, you know, a situation where we've said this is what the safety standard says, and there's a gap, and the plants say no, there isn't a gap. Yeah. 
Okay. 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 So I, I don't know anything about it, <laughs> and I'm not even allowed on the floor <laughs> um, of the building where that all happens. So in, in terms of proliferation, that, that will be dealt with from a completely different set of, of uh, security and safeguard standards. Um, there's, there's not much that we do in a league. I'm, I'm trying to get to, to your concern over this modifications thing. Um, we, we don't look at the safety of, in, of individual modifications. We, we look at whether the plant has a process that will deliver safe modifications. But we don't say, I want to look at your modification on um, the safety system X and, and tell you whether we think that is safe or not. We, you can't do that in two weeks. You, you just can't do it. So we're, we're looking at whether the, they are doing things in the right way. Yeah. The, they are responsible for safety, and the, they are, they are accountable to the regulator for making sure that they comply with the with the member states regulations. So we we don't go in and say, um, you know, you, this modification is unsafe. If we're walking around the plant and we see somebody working at height without proper protection for working at height, we we would say to the person with us, hey, we think that's unsafe. We think you should stop it. So we wouldn't we wouldn't allow things to just go on that we would think we thought were unsafe, but we have no authority on the plant itself. You know, we would say, my first question would be, do you think that is safe? And I'm hoping that they would reach the same conclusion I would. Uh, moving on, um, we also are able to do some uh, help in the area of design assessment. Um, Again, this is, this is, when you think about design as a whole, it's a very, very wide range of, of things. So um, a, lot, a lot of different activities. So there's you know, design safety, so design evaluation for licensing purposes, uh, safety analysis, either deterministic or probabilistic through the, through the plant life. So if, if people want us to review whether their probabilistic safety assessment is, is accurate or complete, we could go and help them to do that. Um, we could look at their severe accident management program. Um, obviously, much more interest in that nowadays. Uh, or we could look at uh, specific topics, say, in their 10-yearly periodic safety review, which quite a few member states do, although not all. Um, site and external events design tends to be um, mainly up in, in advance of constructing a plant. So this is all about how you select a site for a nuclear power plant and how you assess it against um, its requirements in terms of you know, seismic vulnerability. Is it an area subject to floods? Uh, is it in a tornado region? Does it have sandstorms? Um, does it have a you know, very high tidal range? Is it, on, is it on a river whose course may shift? All, all that sort of thing associated with the site. Um, and external events like floods or earthquakes. Um, it would uh, obviously provide, an, again, an independent review about whether the, the, um, the site assessment has complied with the IEA safety standards. Uh, obviously, it's multidisciplinary because you know, uh, uh, seismic factors are very different to uh, geo, you know, geographical factors like extremes of weather or vulnerability to tornadoes, etc. We've done a lot of these, but they tended to have been uh, more focused on, on specific areas. Anyway, we are able to offer this service. Uh, someone mentioned, I think it was you who mentioned, okay, is it, is it just operational power plants? No, it's operation and, operational and commissioning power plants. It's also fuel cycle facilities and also research reactors as well. So this, uh, this tends to follow the, the same, again, the same principles as those are. But uh, you know, a research reactor operates quite differently to an operating power plant. 
Um, so uh, obviously we look at we look at the things that are applicable to research reactors. I'm not a research reactor man myself, so I, I'm not as knowledgeable about this. But the same sorts of things: safety analysis, operating limits, regulatory supervision, aging management, radiation protection, um, and I think criticality will come into this. Again, same, same sort of principle, main mission followed 18 to 12 to 18 months later by a follow-up mission. Oops. And if, uh, if a plant is ready to be constructed, again, we can, we can also offer a service, okay, are you ready to actually start construction now? So fairly, uh, fairly specialized review service, but again, there are guidelines, which if, if nothing else, act as a really good source of information for self-assessments. And then there's some other stuff as well. Uh, again, I, I'm already out of time, but I, I, just, I would just mention them. We can look at emergency preparedness, uh, which I think Catherine mentioned earlier, uh, education and training, occupational radiation protection advisory stuff. Uh, and, and then this, these are the things recognize the fact that the IAEA doesn't just deal in nuclear power. It also deals with other applications of radiation, for instance, in medical use, industrial use, in crops, insect control, you know, and wherever you've got, you know, the use of radiation in those areas, radiation protection for people involved in that work is also important. And again, transport safety, and uh, Catherine mentioned how far back transport safety goes in the IEA's history. So again, we can offer that. So the tagline there, you know, we cover an awful lot more just the nuclear power related issues. So, um, just a very quick uh, summary. Uh, we, we, we aim to improve nuclear safety by helping member states to enhance their own capacity to uh, evaluate safety within their own boundaries and do, so, and do good comprehensive self-assessments. We support regulators and operators um, in developing and applying nuclear safety skills because when people come on our missions, they do pick up useful skills that they can then apply when they go back to their own their own plants. It's it's, it's what we really it's it's what, one of our important things for us that we broaden the knowledge across the whole industry. And by um, implementing recommendations from the missions, then the plants are making direct improvements in their own nuclear safety or radiation safety. Thank you. <laughs>